Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Brian Deese. I'm the director of the National Economic Council, and on behalf of the president uh, and our entire administration team, I want to welcome you all, uh, leaders and doers from across the country, for this convening on zoning and land use reform and how these inter issues interact with our efforts and President Biden's efforts to boost the supply of affordable housing across the country. Um, as you all know, and um, know better than uh, most, while we've seen particular challenges associated with this pandemic, housing supply is a longstanding economic and national challenge uh, that creates real challenges for our economy and for families and for economic mobility and opportunity across the country. Um, over the last 50 years, construction of entry-level starter homes has fallen from 418,000 units per year to 65,000 units in 2020. Um, according to estimates from Freddie Mac, there were 3.8 million units uh, short of demand, uh, uh, and that's up 52% since uh, 2018. So we know the challenges that supply constraints uh, present, which is why we have put housing stability and housing affordability as at the center of President Biden's economic strategy uh, and a strategy to, provide, to, to drive economic growth um, that improves fairness and equity. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing as administration uh, to take on this issue and then get into what is a fantastic uh, set of speakers um, and conversation that I hope we will have today. Um, as I think many of you know, after months of negotiations yesterday, the president put forward a framework for his Build Back Better agenda that he's confident can pass Congress. Um, this agreement includes an historic investment in housing. This would be the largest uh, housing bill in our nation's history. Uh, certainly the most significant uh, housing investment since the creation of HUD in 1965. And at the center of it is encouraging more supply of affordable housing that would uh, lead to the construction and rehabilitation of more than a million new homes. Um, that includes historic investments in the housing trust fund and the home uh, program. Uh, and it also includes the first ever federal competitive grant program to award flexible and attractive funding to jurisdictions that take concrete steps to eliminate needless barriers to, product, uh, to producing affordable housing. Um, and that's a recognition from our administration that, uh, that inclusionary zoning can help be really at the core of boosting supply and bringing down costs. Um, all of this builds on actions that we've taken as administration to use existing authorities to boost the supply of affordable housing units. We estimate those steps could increase uh, units by 100,000 over the next three years, which include the relaunch of the federal financing bank's risk sharing program and policies to prioritize homeownership and sales to nonprofits rather than large investors of government insured and backed uh, owned properties. But I want to underscore, and this is where I think this convening is so important, is that we recognize, and in fact, core to our strategy is the recognition that the federal government um, not only can't address the challenges of housing supply and affordability alone, but in fact, states and local governments are at the center of how we can solve this housing supply challenge as a country. Um, you all have play the most prominent and important roles in putting policies and incentives in place to boost the supply of affordable housing efficiently. Um, and that's why we're all here today. Uh, that's why um, on behalf of the National Economic Council, and the Domestic Policy Council working together, we're launching a series of these action oriented convenings to explore how we can work together across all levels of government to boost housing supply. Uh, and it's fitting for us that we start that uh, with, uh, with a focus on one of the most critical challenges we face, which is exclusion, exclusionary zoning and land use policies. We all know this is an issue that presents tremendous challenges. They are textured, they're nuanced, they are fundamentally local, um, uh, and we need to be creative and work in collaboration collectively to find ways uh, to, uh, to, to, to solve them. Um, uh, one study uh, who uh, we have the privilege of having the uh, one of its authors uh, here at Glazer uh, found that these types of restrictions on supply limit labor mobility to the extent of costing the economy up to 2% uh, of GDP annually. 
a striking uh, uh, finding, but one that underscores the opportunity here of making progress, uh, even at the margin, in addressing those restrictions on housing supply. And it's an area where we're seeing incredibly exciting progress at the local level um, and across the country, um, from California and Oregon to Austin, Louisville, all across the country, um, exciting progress, the great national laboratory of experimentation um, at work. Um, we're seeing state and local governments take steps like allowing duplexes or two to four unit properties or parcels previously reserved for single family homes allowing somewhat taller buildings, expediting review and processes for upzoning. Um, and we are excited to hear about some of that progress today um, and how communities found solutions that worked for the communities um, with organizing, making it possible to not only identify policies that, that, that sound good in a model or on paper, but actually work on the ground that reflect local stakeholder input and buy-in that's what's going to be necessary to actually make progress, durable progress uh, um, in this space. So our hope for today is that this conversation, this dialogue will energize your efforts to take on these issues uh, in your states and communities. Um, and uh, because for us, here's the bottom line, even with the progress at the federal level that we're making, even with this legislation, which be transformative uh, and historic, we need this to be fundamentally a partnership with policies on the ground um, that encourage boosting supply in ways that work for communities uh, and that will be durable. Um, and I wanna just reiterate where I started, this administration uh, and this president, all of us who work for him, we're committed to doing everything we can at the federal level to facilitate that state and local action um, and, that, and to build on conversations and convenings like this to try to encourage progress at the local level. So with that, I wanna welcome you, thank you. Uh, we're gonna to try to make this conversation as practical and solutions oriented as possible. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna start in that effort by turning it over to uh, my colleague and partner uh, in, uh, in so many things, uh, Dr. Cece Rouse, uh, chair of our Council of Economic Advisors. Thanks, Cece. Good afternoon and thank you, Brian. And thank you for kicking us off. And thank you all for taking part in this very important conversation. As Brian mentioned, we're here today to talk about inclusive zoning reform because stable, affordable housing is the foundation upon which working families build their lives and invest in their children's future. I'd like to take this time to discuss the economic case for zoning reform, which is key to alleviating housing supply constraints. As you all know, the housing shortage crisis in the United States is not a new one. For decades, housing supply has not kept pace with population growth. And for decades, we've seen exclusionary zoning contribute to inequality and stifle economic growth. The problem only worsened during the pandemic. You heard Brian speak about the president's Build Back Better framework and the critical investments it will, build, it will make to build and rehabilitate more than 1 million affordable homes in the United States. On top of making historic investments in rental assistance and community-led redevelopment projects, the framework will incentivize state and local zoning reforms to boost housing supply and liberalize restrictive land use policies. And when it comes to implementing these zoning regulations, we'll continue to rely on, rely on our partners across state and local governments, uh, all, including all of you, all of you leaders who are here today. As you all know, know so well, zoning laws often place restrictions on the number, type, and size of homes that are, can be built in any given area. It's not uncommon for a single family home to be the only type of home allowed in a particular zone. In addition, there's been a sharp decrease in the number of new entry level homes for first time home buyers since the Great Recession. As a result, the bottom rung of the home ownership ladder is completely out of reach for young families trying to build wealth through housing. There's also been an inadequate supply of housing for renters and for those who live in public housing, which we've seen through historically high rental prices and deteriorating public housing stock. Beyond limiting the types of homes that get built, exclusionary zoning has a profound impact on social welfare and economic opportunity because where a family lives matters. Evidence shows that neighborhoods can affect long run outcomes for children, 
from their health, access to education, and even their long run earning potential. At one point, zoning was used for the explicit purpose of excluding people of color from neighborhoods. While that's no longer legal, zoning laws still disproportionately harm people of color by creating and compounding disparities in measurable outcomes. For instance, many lower income and minority neighborhoods in cities have become heat islands, where fewer trees and a higher number of concrete buildings and parking lots significantly increase temperatures. This negatively impacts the health and ability for students to learn and the development of their human capital. Communities of color suffer more from unfair zoning laws and exclusion from accessible housing um, also means exclusion from the opportunity to build wealth. In the long run, this exclusion perpetuates racial inequality as housing likely explains more than 30% of the black white racial wealth gap. We've also seen the housing shortage produce larger macroeconomic effects that have shaped and will continue to shape our economy in the long term. For example, a substantial stock of readily available uh, affordable housing can limit labor mobility, as Brian mentioned, based on the work of uh, Dr. Ed Glazer, which in turn affects economic growth. If workers can't afford to move to higher productivity areas where housing prices are also higher, then large parts of our labor force are restricted from pursuing better opportunities that ultimately contribute more to our economy. Since the 1960s, this misallocation of labor has led to a significant decrease in the economic growth rate. President Biden knows that we need inclusive zoning, zoning laws if we want to expand our affordable housing stock, advance racial equity, and produce economic growth in the long term. That's why the Build Back Better framework makes historic investments in making our housing supply more plentiful and affordable. And that's why housing will continue to be a pillar of the Biden administration's domestic policy agenda. By making historic investments at the federal level, and by continuing to lean on state and local leaders at every step of the process, I believe in our ability to measurably and comprehensively fortify our housing infrastructure and expand wealth building opportunities for more Americans. Thank you. Now I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ed Glazer. Th thank you, Dr. Rask. Thank you so much for having me uh, here. And I am so grateful the administration is making zoning reform a central part of their, their housing uh, message. My job, as I understand it today, is to remind us of the many costs of, of land use regulation, the many costs of having an America in which insiders have increasingly set up rules that make it difficult for outsiders to find their way. Now, most obviously, our highly productive places have become unaffordable. America, as has been mentioned, becomes less productive because we have closed the metropolitan frontier, because our proud history in which people have left less productive places, be it the rocky farms of uh, New England to populate the Ohio River Basin or uh, Ohio River Valley, or have left Oklahoma during the middle of the Dust Bowl to find opportunity in California. Mobility has been always one of the things that America has offered, and yet we have seen a closing of the metropolitan frontier that has locked people in regions of economic dysfunction. Segregation by race is exacerbated, and opportunity for the children of the poor is reduced. Insiders become wealthier, outsiders lose out, housing bubbles become more extreme, and ultimately, even regulations that are allegedly motivated to help the environment end up making our environment worse by reducing the amount of housing in our most environmentally sensitive areas in the areas where we have the lowest carbon emissions and increasing housing construction in places where we have the highest carbon emissions. So let me just start with the price. Along the horizontal axis here is the amount of new building between 2000 and 2013. Along the vertical axis is the gulf between housing price and the marginal physical cost of construction. What a number like three means for Greater San Francisco is that it costs three times as much to buy a house as it costs to build a house. What this graph shows you is that the places that build a lot aren't expensive and the places that are expensive don't build a lot. There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. And don't tell me that Austin or Las Vegas or Raleigh are inexpensive because people don't want to live there. Tens of thousands of people want to live there and they make space for people to move in. Whereas our coastal cities that are more regulated do not. 
Here you can simply see the relationship between uh, the Wharton Residential Land Use Regulatory Index and housing prices. Places that are more regulated have higher housing prices. And that is one reason, one major reason why they, uh, why they have less housing production. This rather dense slide is from uh, the work of Shea and Moretti. And they're the ones who actually put that 2% number. So they actually estimate just the enormous amount of economic loss that comes from the fact that we do not allow growth in our most productive places. Matching where uh, people live to where people are productive is an incredibly important part of the American economy. And zoning makes that harder. Land use regulation makes that more difficult. Now, I am profoundly disturbed by the rise of prime aged joblessness in the US. That joblessness is not ubiquitous, it is not everywhere. It is disproportionately concentrated in some areas. Now, there are many answers to trying to make the economic difficulties of America's Eastern heartland less difficult. But surely one possibility is that Americans could be able to move as well, and zoning can make that possible. Zoning can enable you to get out of places where you don't want to be. More than 30% of, of prime age men are not working, live on their parents' couches, right? You've got to think that they're locked in place in part because it's just so expensive to move to San Francisco or move to uh, New York City. Now, as uh, Dr. Rouse just said, the origins of uh, land use controls, the origins of zoning are in fact in race. This is Baltimore, which in fact originated uh, zoning by race. The Supreme Court did strike uh, zoning by race down uh, about 100 years ago, but the legacy of zoning by race lives on. For racially, uh, for exclusionary zoning has long prevented African-Americans from integrating into different neighborhoods. And you can perhaps see this on this map uh, this is zoning regulation in my own city, where I am right now in Cambridge. And oh, here you can see the multifamily residential areas. They correspond highly to where you have African-Americans living. Okay, And what this is telling you is that when you stop there to being any sort of taller buildings, you're making it difficult for people who are, aren't wealthy enough to buy in to actually find opportunity, to find a place to live. And that limits the ability of the city to provide uplift for everyone. And indeed, one of that, that is one of the prevalent patterns that come out of Raj Chetty's Opportunity Atlas data, that in fact, cities with more segregation, as measured by the Dissimilarity Index, have lower upward mobility for African-Americans, right? This is the legacy of zoning. This is the legacy of excessive uh, regulation that makes it so difficult for people to move into areas where they could actually find opportunity, where their children can find uh, a better future. We have also engaged in a monumental wealth transfer, essentially from outsiders to insiders. So I want you to look at 35 to 44 year olds. We are looking at 2013 dollars, housing wealth in 1983 and 2013. Middle income, 35 to 44 year olds had housing wealth in 1983. They had $55,000 on, on average, which isn't nothing. By 2013, they only had 6,000. 90% of that housing wealth had disappeared. 75th income percentile, it had dropped by 50% from $118,000 to $58,000. So our younger, our middle-aged Americans even, just have much less housing wealth unless they are extremely rich. By contrast, look at older Americans, look at wealthy Americans, right? So 55 to 64-year-old Americans, let's say at the 90th income percent, 99th income percentile, their wealth has gone up from $760,000 to $1.5 million. And if you are lucky enough to have bought a home in Los Angeles in 1970, you have done extraordinarily well. You are a protected insider, right? Whereas good luck to someone who's trying to find uh, a, a, an affordable home in Los Angeles today. You know, in my new book, Survival of the City, I tell the story of the battles over gentrification in Boyle Heights in, in LA, in Los Angeles, where, where the story seems to pit, you know, gentrifiers, young hip gentrifiers against longtime uh, residents of the neighborhood, long-term uh, Latino residents of the neighborhood. They're fighting the wrong enemy. The right enemy is not, is not these two groups, both of whom have been pushed aside, both of whom are outsiders. The real enemy are the insiders who make it impossible for Los Angeles to add uh, new space. And of course, the inability to build shapes how we experience housing bubbles, like the great housing convulsion of 2000 to 2010. This is Atlanta. The green line shows, shows quantity. It shows the amount of new construction, rises during the boom, falls during the bust. The new supply of housing reduces price variation. By contrast, look at the orange line, that's prices. It barely moves at all. Now let's look at San Francisco, a highly constrained area. San Francisco, very little change in, in new construction, very little new construction period, right? 
And yet the housing prices soar up and then, then drop down. And finally, it is often depicted as if these regulations are about you know, preserving uh, the environment. And yet together with USC environmental economist, Matthew Kahn, I have estimated carbon emissions associated with living in all sorts of different parts of the country. What you find is that the places that are the greenest, the places that have the lowest carbon emissions are also the places that are most regulated. They're green overwhelmingly because of their climate. They're green because they have mild winters and mild summers. And on top of that, they even have access to public transportation. And when you turn off housing construction in greater San Francisco or greater LA, it turns on outside of Houston. It turns on outside of Oklahoma City. And while you know, it's a great thing that Houston is able to provide affordable housing for middle-income Americans, it's not a great thing for the environment. And zoning, once and again, has the responsibility for shaping America in a way that we shouldn't allow it to be shaped. And so I'm going to end here, um, but saying again how delighted I am that the administration has put this forward and how important it is that America once again and its cities once again become a nation and places for outsiders, outsiders who can come and find affordable housing and can make their future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glazer. It has been uh, fantastic to have you as part of our program today, one of America's preeminent urban economists, helping us better understand the implications of zoning reforms on our economy and on our communities. Um, so with that, I am Erica Pothig, Special Assistant to the President for Housing and Urban Policy in the White House Domestic Policy Council. I wanna invite the panelists uh, who I have the privilege of moderating to turn on their cameras uh, and join me uh, in, the, in the Zoom webinar. Um, we have with us today, I'm pleased to say, Austin Mayor Steve Adler um, and San Diego County Board Chair Nathan Fletcher and Gina Dunlap, who's a Strategic Advisor and 2019 Harvard Loeb Fellow. Um, thank you so much. Um, we know that uh, uh, Mayor Steve Adler uh, has is in the middle of a council meeting uh, today, <laughs> as I as I'm sure uh, Board Chair Fletcher can appreciate. It's very dynamic and, and not able to control the time. So we appreciate when he is able to to join us in this conversation. Thank you all for coming and sharing some of your she wisdom and your time. Man. Um, just a second, Mayor Adler, just a second. Yeah. Um, so pleased to have you as a part of this conversation. What we want to set out today is first Good two Norm, two panels. Um, the first panel conversation we're going to have is about local action. That's where, and, and Dr. Glazer just illustrated for us, that's where it happens. It's where the rubber hits the road. It's where the hard work gets done. And we want to hear about your success in uh, advancing reforms. And then we're going to turn to a panel uh, moderated by my colleague, uh, Julie Rodriguez, on state policy. Uh, that's also an important complement to, to local action. So let's get going. I'm going to invite first uh, Mayor um, Adler uh, to uh, help us better understand uh, what Austin is doing in this regard. We know that Austin is one of the fastest growing cities in America with very strong housing demand as illustrated uh, by the presentation we just saw. Um, by one statistic, it has the fifth most housing permits in the country over the past decade. Uh, and zoning and permitting challenges constrain the supply of housing. So Mayor Adler, I think you're with us. Uh, we're very curious uh, to know what steps you've taken to address the constraints in housing supply and grow your housing stock to meet the demand. Uh, the very clear demand of people wanting to uh, stay in and, and move to your city. I'm here. Can you? But it, but it's, yes, we can hear you. It's yes. A, but it says that the ho I can't be up here by video unless the host allows me to be up here. Okay. I think there we are. All right. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us in what I know is a dynamic moment. Uh, so we appreciate you being here. No, 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 no. I appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone else. Housing is obviously key. It's the existential challenge in the city of Austin. We're the uh, fastest growing large metropolitan area by rate if we have been for the last 10 years. So we don't have anywhere near the housing supply that we need and housing prices are among the highest escalating. 
Uh, it is a progressive city, but as progressive as Austin is, we run into the same kind of culture wars associated with even progressives trying to preserve and protect neighborhoods in the same condition that they have been in, in a legacy kind of way. Uh, we came within days after a several year process of adopting a new comprehensive zoning plan for the entire city, only to have the courts stop it uh, because they treated it as if we were doing 400,000 individual zoning cases, each with their own individual rights for appeal and process, which makes comprehensive zoning changes impossible. I alert that to people because now it's in our appellate courts. And a year later, for being stopped, it's going to be argued next week. Uh, so if people are caught to that same battle, I can tell you the up to the state legal research on where the law is around the country, uh, we have right now. And we'll find out next week what happens. In the meantime, recognizing that we don't have the present ability to do a comprehensive zoning change, we're trying to find where the Venn diagrams cross so that we can actually do progressive zoning changes, adding density, diminishing setbacks, reducing parking requirements. Uh, how do you do that in a world where the culture war is strong and the, the NIMBY side is, is politically powerful? Uh, so we've done some things to try and get around that. Uh, we uh, were successful in, in, in establishing a, a practice that allows for changes in our zoning when associated with commitments for affordable housing. So most of the progressive policies that you would want in terms of parking or setbacks or density or height, we allow, but only to the degree that the property owner petitioning for that ability is willing to forever dedicate a certain portion uh, and it varies, but it's not it's, you know, 10 percent or 15 percent, depending on whether it's below 80 percent or below 60 percent of deep family income. But we use that because we find that it's hard even for the NIMBY element to oppose a project that's delivering affordability in a city that so desperately needs it. Uh, and, and we're trying to engage in that kind of guerrilla war at this moment in as many different ways as we can. We've also established an Austin Housing Conservancy, which uses market forces, not subsidies, to preserve Class B and C multifamily projects before they're bought and purchased and converted into Class A apartments or condominiums. Uh, it's a nonprofit that's been set up as a conservancy. It's the general partner, but otherwise it's a limited partnership. But it gives investors the ability to have a really safe 6% to 7% return on their dollars. Uh, and we're trying to get individual donors to participate, um, recognizing it's not paying the 15% return that people could get if they were to convert those projects. But the 6% is a safe enough return. We're arguing, give us some of your bond investment and put it into this kind of investment. And we've been able to preserve about 2,000 units that way thus far. So it looks like it's a model that might very well be something that can, uh, that can, that can work. Uh, we sure do like what HUD's doing and the help with the, the support. And boy, I tell you, we need, we need more of that. And then we're anxious to see the, the, the bills pass so that those additional funding come in. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're right on the verge of that culture war trying to do as best we can. Thank you so much, Mayor. And we will look forward to seeing the outcome and uh, of the appellate court case. But I appreciate that you what you are doing, notwithstanding uh, that that litigation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I want to turn now, um, if you could just mute yourself, uh, Mayor <laughs> Adler. Thank you. Um, I want to turn now to um, to Board Chair Fletcher. Um, you have, you sit, uh, you're a very busy man. You sit on the board of, <laughs> it would see many different agencies so that offer you, a, I think, a really unique perspective about the connection between housing affordability uh, and transportation and transit. Um, a regionally uh, speaking as well. Um, so I'm very curious about how that's translated uh, into new land use and housing policy in San Diego County. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erica. And thank you to your whole uh, intergovernmental team. We're, we're really grateful at the local level for all that you do. Uh, I'll also note as a, as a county supervisor, uh, we take a measure of pride that our president started 
uh, his political career on the new council, county council, uh, county commission, whatever that was called back then, as the equivalent of a county supervisor. And so we, we appreciate those local roots um, and, and really appreciate all you're doing. The, the efforts you've put uh, into encouraging reforms around exclusionary zoning in the incentive program and grant program for what you're pushing at the federal level is going to help drive this whole conversation in a substantive way. And so we're, we're very grateful. But I just said it in an inter interesting intersection and in that I chair our county board of supervisors. Um, we are the, the fifth largest county uh, in, in the United States. Uh, I also chair our local transit agency, the Metropolitan Transit System. We operate our bus and trolley and shuttle network. And I'm the Governor Newsom's appointee to the Air Resources Board. And so we have a lot of these things that we have to align. Uh, we know that we have to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And even though we're moving to electrify our transportation sector, which is the single largest driver of GHGs, it is not going to happen fast enough uh, to tackle the reality of what we face today uh, with rising sea level that impacts us here in a coastal community. So we have to lower our vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we have to lower our greenhouse gas emissions. And we know that we have to increase the supply of housing. And as Mayor Adler just said, and, and you know, one of, one of my favorite cities outside of my own in Austin, we've got to reset our mindset. And, and, and at least in San Diego County, we don't have huge swaths of available land to do large single family home suburban sprawl. We don't have them. The areas where that land exists are areas that are in high fire prone areas. You can't get insurance. I'm gonna tell you if the insurance industry can't come up with a dollar amount to charge you there's no dollar amount you can pay for insurance. That's what I call an indicator that is probably not worth the risk of putting the housing there. It also skyrockets VMT. And so this mindset shift we're having to make back to infill, back to greater density, that is where we run into the, to, to some of the problems. And so I think it's a recognition that in California, we care about environmental protections. We care about paying our workers fairly. We don't want to use taxpayer funds to subsidize the construction of housing with workers that have such low wage, we're gonna to have to subsidize their existence. And we also care about increasing density. And so how you align these things together is what creates that rub. And we're doing a lot of things in California. Uh, you're gonna hear later from Senator Scott Weiner, who's been leading on state efforts uh, around changing state policies and, and, and putting pressure on local governments. And I commend him, keep pressuring us to do what we have to do because you get the pressure from the NIMBY side and we've got to have the pressure on the other side, but we're doing things on auxiliary housing units or granny flats, we're tackling height limits. We've got things we're doing around duplexes and quads and, and putting those density bonuses are a great thing. Mayor Adler, I think referred to what's what we call density bonus. As you increase the number of affordable units, uh, you can increase the, the density um, on those projects, uh, but we have to have elected officials that have the courage to overcome those 17 folks from a neighborhood who any change and change is hard, I get it, but we have an obligation. We have to figure out how we can do this in, in a responsible way. The other thing that we've done somewhat creatively is in the county government setting, we have land use jurisdiction for the unincorporated area, the areas outside of our incorporated cities. And that's where we tend to generally, before I got here, think exclusively about where we put housing. But the unincorporated areas are a challenge to put housing because most of them are more rural. Uh, they, you have VMT issues, you have uh, uh, multiple species conservation plan issues, you have water issues, you have fire danger issues. And so we're gonna continue to build housing in the unincorporated where it is appropriate. But we are looking at county owned land in other jurisdictions. I have multiple projects in my district, which is in the city of San Diego, where we are doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of 100% affordable units on county owned land inside the city of San Diego. It gives us some flexibility uh, around zoning because we own the land, we can come in and start doing fair agreements around how much workers get paid and those types of things. So there's opportunities where government can build on their own land. There's a lot of creative things you can do with land trusts and all types of things uh, to really, you know, the cost of the land is one of the biggest barriers and if government owns it, then that's a public resource. Uh, we can invest that appropriately. We're doing the same at my transit agency and this is, is, is where, where I'll end on this on, on transit agencies. We as an agency, uh, pre-COVID, we're one of the few transit agencies in America seeing month over month ridership increases. We were doing all kinds of creative things to get more people on our buses and trolleys. We're taking shoulders of freeways and creating rapid bus lanes and increased grade separating our, our, our trolley system so it can run more frequently. But we also looked at what land we own adjacent to our transit centers. And we now have almost 20 projects moving where we are building affordable housing 
adjacent to a transit center, which means you don't need the same parking requirements because you can walk right out your door and get on the truck. We have greater flexibility around height. And because as an agency, we own the land, we just, we just cut the ribbon on beginning a process, an affordable housing mixed commercial use project on our trolley stop that is being constructed under a project labor agreement with 100% union labor. Because those union workers aren't going to need affordable housing. They're going to be able to buy housing. And so we're tackling both the wages there. Now, where we need more help is I need to create more transit lines. And that is why what you all are pushing at the federal level is so vital. That investment you can send to transit agencies to increase our zero emission buses, to increase our bus lines, to increase rail lines and frequency also is allowing us to increase the availability of housing because now I can put housing adjacent to transit and I can tackle my greenhouse gas goals. I can tackle my vehicle miles traveled goals and I can tackle constructing more housing. And that is where that federal investment uh, in so much of what you're pushing is so vital. It's not just about building transit, transit and housing. Th these two things go together. Transportation and housing are one issue, particularly in more urban settings with less uh, of the available land. And so in California, you know, it, it's always, it's gonna cost a little bit more. We care a lot about our environment. We care a lot about our workers, uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't things that we can do to drive the construction of more housing in the right place, done the right way. Uh, and we're pushing and we're so grateful for the entire Biden administration. Uh, all of the things you're pushing have a direct tie to us on the ground, able to lower greenhouse gas emissions and build housing and take care of our workers. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. That's fantastic. There is so much richness in what you just said. I mean, we are, I hope our audience sees and, and do, uh, drills in more to the uh, great practice and policy that you're advancing in San Diego County. So thank you for for bringing uh, some insight to that. I wanna turn now to Gina Dunlap uh, from Louisville, uh, Kentucky. Um, and uh, we know from other successful efforts uh, to achieve zoning reform, that it doesn't just happen without a lot of citizen engagement um, and education. We've heard even that today. So do you know what inspired Louisville's recent efforts uh, and help us understand the process you use to build support for them? Yes, thank you, Erica. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, you're absolutely right. Um, having the community involved is paramount um, to, to creating positive change. And um, in some of the information that's been shared today, Louisville's no stranger uh, to issues around race and zoning, um, dating back to the Buchanan versus Worley Supreme Court case um, in 1918. Um, uh, fast forward a few decades, um, Mayor Greg Fisher um, his administration has always um, lifted equity um, and inclusion as a, a major staple um, in the in the current administration. Um, but that doesn't mean we haven't had challenges, particularly in how to operationalize concepts around equity. Uh, so I'm really happy to share in 2020, um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the controversy surrounding the death of Breonna Taylor, uh, the Louisville Metro Council took a major step in establishing a new standing committee focused solely on equity and inclusion. Um, as a result of that, um, they, as well as the Planning Commission, adopted uh, separate resolutions to basically do an equity review of our land development code. Um, that in and of itself was a major step and acknowledgement um, at some of the disparities with, with regard to land use um, and the restrictions. Um, along with educating and hosting a public dialogue, uh, the planning staff led by Emily Liu, our planning director, created um, an interactive map called Confronting Racism in City Planning and Zoning that really digs into the history and the mechanics, so to speak, of the impact that you see um, in a zoning context. Um, we also had a bit of a town and gown arrangement with our graduate urban planning students creating another interactive map around neighborhood planning in Louisville. Again, another facet of how we operationalize um, equity and justice in the land use context. Um, overall, with community's input, uh, the planning team came up with some 46 recommendations um, to tweak and enhance our current land development code. Um, they're not tackling all of that all at once, of course, because that's, you know, a huge task. 
um, and we do have to move at the speed of trust and transparency, um, making sure that everybody's aware of the benefits, um, you know, maybe the cons of, of certain um, technical changes. Um, but just recently, um, last fall, the Metro Council did move to adopt new um, uh, parameters around the creation of ADUs or accessory dwelling units, you know, units that show up on existing properties um, where maybe there's already an owner occupant, but they want to create uh, more spaces for people to live um, affordably. So in a, in a city, in a merged city county government where 75 percent of all the land here is, is zoned residential. Um, that's, you know, a huge boost. It will not solve all of our housing crisis, but it's certainly a step in the right direction, particularly for those who want to, you know, provide, develop, and create more opportunities at more housing price points uh, for more families. That's terrific. Thank you for that context. Um, so one last uh Parting question for you all um, as we transition to the next panel uh, focused on state policy and, and Chair Fletcher, you already called out the, the importance of state policy at providing that, that cover. Um, I'm curious, what piece of advice would you have for other elected officials, planning officials, or other champions of these efforts in other cities? What have you learned uh, and what wisdom would you wanna impart uh, as we close this conversation today? Yeah, thank, thank you, Erica. Look, I think the big point I would drive is that when you have a problem that, that you, you have to do something different, that requires change. Money, rights, land, influence, it is not a continuum, it is a pie. And if you're going to do something different, that means you're, it's going to be fundamentally different than the way it is before. So you can't be so afraid of opposition. You can't be so fearful of opposition that it binds you from doing anything. If, if what you're doing has no opposition, it is not change. It is a continuation of the status quo. And so whether that means real conversations around what locals should have land use and where they shouldn't if they aren't doing the right things, when it's real conversations about, no, you're not going to dump all of the affordable housing for low-income people of color next to a polluting factory. Like, these are the difficult conversations that we have to get involved in. Look, we're, we're doubling. It, it's not just constructing more housing. Absolutely construct more housing. But we've got real issues in San Diego with vacancy. I have foreign wealth funds buying entire floors of condo buildings that sit empty forever. The point of zoning and building is pointless if no one buys it. It's a real conversation around how many individual homes should one person have and reap a tax benefit for. Do you need to own six homes and get a tax benefit? Or at some number, do you pay more? Because again, that's a housing unit that was constructed that's never occupied, it's not serving as housing. Real conversations around short-term vacation rentals. We zone for hotels and we zone for housing, but when all the housing become hotels, well, we've got a real regulatory issue and challenge. And then the final point I would just say is a part of this discussion around availability of housing is 100% right and more housing will impact the cost of that housing. But we can't lose sight of the other side of this, which is we also have to talk about the wages of American workers. Because if we just continue to let workers get misclassified and exploited and their attempts to join a union interfered with, and we say, well, we're going to take all this taxpayer funds to subsidize affordable housing. In some regard, we have to be careful that we're not subsidizing greed and we're not subsidizing economic inequality. And if we raise the wages of American workers and lower the cost of housing, then we can find a spot where we're actually in a sustainable way getting there. And, and, and I am so grateful. What the president is proposing is the single largest investment in our nation's history in transit and affordable housing, and it will do more to help us on the local level with all of these issues uh, than anything else. And we're grateful for the fight you all are in and, and what you're trying to do. Um, and that partnership is gonna be key to us being able to uh, improve the lives for, for the folks we represent. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We're gonna put you on the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're calling that out. So one piece, uh, quick quick piece of advice, Gina, before we turn it over to the next panel. Sure, sure. I, I would focus on um, intention and representation. So practitioners, elected officials, those who are responsible um, for planning should really be intentional about seeking out 
as many diverse perspectives from as many stakeholders as possible. One thing that hasn't been mentioned today yet, but goes in tandem with, with housing is child care. You know, the ability to actually create child care facilities is governed by the zoning process as well. And so that's just as important as access to transportation. Um, but also making, you know, it's not political per se, but planning commissioners are appointed. And it's very important that there is diversity inclusion among people that sit on the boards and commissions um, that make case by case decisions, even regardless of the, the code and the structure itself. So th those would be my two things. Thank you for raising the care agenda. That is so important. That is a really critical piece. Uh, it's obviously also a critical piece of the president's Build Back Better agenda. So thank you for bringing that forward in the conversation today. And thank you uh, to Mayor Adler, to Chair Fletcher, to Gina Dunlap for helping us uh, really appreciate and understand the hard work, but also the great impact uh, that these reforms can have. So thank you. I'm going to um, now turn it over to my colleague, Julie Rodriguez, who's going to introduce the next uh, panel on state policy. Um, thank you all uh, very much. Well, thank you so much, Erica, Gina, um, Chair Fletcher, uh, Mayor Adler. What a dynamic panel and what a great opportunity to hear about some really exciting efforts um, at the local level. And now we're gonna be able to um, transition to our next panel and really excited to be able to moderate this panel with three state elected officials who have been leading the way in housing reform in their states to discuss actions state governments have taken to address restrict restrictive land use and zoning codes. So if I can invite um, the following folks to turn their mics on and cameras on, um, California State Senator Scott Weiner, Speaker of Oregon State House, Tina Kotek, and Utah State Senator Jacob Andrig. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and as a proud Californian, it's exciting to um, see uh, the efforts of uh, at both the state level and the local level um, in California being lifted up. But we're also um, really excited to hear from Oregon and Utah. So we'll start with you, Speaker Kotek, um, to kick us off. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I want to uh, do a special shout out to our local government officials in the previous panel. They're doing great work. And I believe state government should be a strong partner with our local government officials. They have a hard job, but we have to work together to solve solutions for our housing crisis. So I want to specifically talk about our efforts in Oregon around middle housing uh, legislation. So uh, middle housing is basically everything between uh, single family standalone homes and multifamily apartments. So duplexes and triplexes and quadplexes and townhomes and cluster apartments. So that's what I'm talking about today, middle housing. So in Oregon, we passed legislation in 2019, House Bill 2001, and our primary motivator around middle housing was that our housing crisis requires us to be as innovative as possible. We need to increase both the overall supply of housing as well as diversify the type of housing options in all of our communities. Oregon's been dealing with a housing supply crisis for the last 20 years. Uh, and it was really a problem that was further exacerbated by the lack of construction in the Great Recession. So the numbers are challenging. Uh, Oregon needs to build 30,000 new units per year to address the state's current housing deficit, as well as uh, address projected population growth. So it became apparent to me very glaringly that we needed to have a serious conversation about balancing our land use system with our need for more housing. You know, Oregonians value a strong land use system. They wanna protect their farmlands and their forests. They don't want sprawl. And we have more people moving here every year. So saying no to any type of land use changes was, was just not going to be helpful. So um, here's one data point I wanna put out before we pass my legislation. The new development of duplexes and triplexes and other middle housing had been banned in 77% of the residential land in the city of Portland. So we had very limited options of what new construction could look like. So when we passed House Bill 2001 in 2019, we became the first state in the nation to basically reestablish middle housing as an option for new construction in communities across the state of Oregon. So here's what the law required, just briefly. In cities in Oregon, over 10,000 people and jurisdictions within the Portland metro area, our largest population area, the, uh, these areas now have to allow duplexes 
in any lot that is that is now zoned for detached uh, single family housing. And in larger cities, cities over 25,000 people, and also jurisdictions within our metro area, um, they will also have to allow middle housing types in areas zoned to allow detached family homes. So duplexes in smaller cities, and then in larger cities, all the other types of middle housing are now allowed in places that have been traditionally over the last several decades only for single family standalone homes. So the law also did another thing. It allowed, uh, uh, it reduced barriers to internal conver conversions of very large homes. So think about those large homes in established neighborhoods. We have dropped the barriers for internal conversions so they can be turned into multiple residences. Something that seems like a no brainer, but we had really made that very difficult to do. So um, the law gives cities, uh, large cities over 25,000 people until the end of June of next year, 2022, to adopt the land use regulations and the plan changes that they need to implement this. So we're in at, we're right in the middle of the implementation of this to transform our housing supply. You know, it was really important for me as we were considering middle housing regulation to have it be a statewide requirement. Because if we tried a different approach where you had incentives, you would have certain communities um, taking it up and others not. For me, housing choice has to be housing choice everywhere. And by having a statewide requirement, we, we create a level playing field for having more options in more communities across the state of Oregon. Um, some of this has been raised before. Middle housing options have multiple benefits. Um, they're less expensive than constructing single family uh, homes. Um, and frankly, all of our states have an affordable housing crisis that we have to deal with. Additionally, as some folks have pointed out, uh, middle housing reduces inequities uh, that have occurred over years, um, intentionally or not intentionally, uh, to uh, reduce diversity in our communities. And housing uh, in, with middle housing um, will have more diversity by income and race and age and size of household in established uh, communities across our state. And that is a positive. Um, in fact, you know, more people will have the opportunity to live in high opportunity areas with middle housing construction. And lastly, talk, people have talked about climate. Um, as we provide more middle housing options in communities, people are gonna be able to live closer where they work, where they wanna send their kids to school, therefore reducing our carbon emissions through um, increased transportation. So um, the re-legalization of middle housing that has occurred in Oregon uh, is very much a long-term solution to providing more supply in our state. Um, it's gonna take about 20 years, I think, to fully implement this, but we are going to see gradual change year after year, provide more housing options in our communities because of this. Uh, and um, I just want to close with this. Let's remember, this isn't new. This is how we used to do things before we came, became wedded to the only idea of a single family home was a standalone home with a big yard. You know, when I moved back to Oregon, moved back to Portland after graduate school, I lived in a very established neighborhood in a, in a fourplex apartment complex, nestled in a, 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 an old neighborhood with all kinds of different types of housing. And it provided a lot of opportunity for me. That's what we want to get back to. And that is really going to help all of us uh, have the opportunity for more households to be able to afford their homes and live in neighborhoods that they want to live in. So um, I'll stop there. Um, look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker Kotek. Um, next, we'd love to hear from uh, Senator Weiner. Senator Weiner, uh, you know, it's often said that um, these efforts kind of bring together strange bedfellows. And so we'd love to hear about the coalition um, that you helped to bring together and, you know, ways in which, um, you know, other states may be able to learn from those experiences and what messages in particular really resonated to kind of bring people together around this common cause. Sure. And, uh... Thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here with uh, Speaker Kotek, um, who's uh, just done tremendous uh, uh, work. So thank you. And I just want to shout out to Supervisor uh, Fletcher, uh, because even though when I try to be really clear about this, uh, our, the fights that we have about local control and housing versus state standards, um, you know, it, it's important not to demonize local government, there are local governments that want to do the right thing, that are doing the right thing, and there are local elected officials who are champions for more uh, housing, and, and Supervisor Fletcher definitely falls into that uh, into that category. Uh, so in, in California, we, we have, over the last five or six years, really both uh, enacted a number of reforms, but also put teeth into reforms that were passed a long time ago. Uh, we, uh, California in the 70s, 
from the late 60s to the early 80s, passed a bunch of great housing laws uh, that had no teeth. And so we put teeth into them. So uh, our uh, accessory dwelling unit um, law in California, which was ignored by cities for almost 35 years, uh, we've now closed all the loopholes and we're seeing a significant uptick in people adding one or even two ADUs uh, to their homes around the state, which is fantastic. Um, our 40 year old uh, uh, density bonus program, which was sort of a dead letter for a long time, has now uh, is being used and we've significantly uh, enhanced it. In fact, Supervisor Fletcher's uh, spouse, Assembly Member Lorena Gonzalez, authored a significant enhancement of our density bonus and uh, developers are using it. 100% um, affordable housing developers are using it. Uh, it's fantastic. And then this year we also um, passed a duplex legislation uh, authored by our Senate leader, Senator Tony Atkins. A lot of San Diegans involved here. Um, and, uh, and I authored Senate Bill 10, which um, allows cities to um, zone for up to 10 units buildings without having to go through uh, environmental review, which can um, delay it for years and years and years. Uh, we also have done a lot of uh, enacted some process reforms to re cut down on the arbitrary denials of projects, projects that are within zoning, but it gets rejected anyway, or it gets chopped in half, or the top story gets chopped off, or or um, conditions are placed on it that make it infeasible. So we've been methodically doing this work um, to try to deal with California's housing shortage of somewhere between two and a half and three and a half million homes. We should be building almost 200,000 a year. Uh, we're building less than half of that. Uh, and so we need to dig ourselves out of the hole. Um, we have uh, I methodically built a really powerful uh, coalition. And, and whenever I have a colleague who's about to take on a hard housing bill and they come to me and they're like, who should I talk to? Um, I send them to our, from whatever our most recent bill was, look at that endorsement list uh, and you will see who to, who to talk to. And so we have a really nice coalition, um, uh, both um, the, the, the builders um, and usually uh, the building trades, although we've had some tension recently between the building trades and the affordable housing builders, and we're hoping to get past that. Um, and that is something that does need to be addressed to make sure we're paying non-poverty wages uh, to construction workers um, and, uh, and making sure that it's gonna work, particularly for people building um, affordable housing who have very little latitude in terms of finances, uh, but I think we'll get there. Um, we have uh, uh, student organizations, uh, we have senior organizations like AARP, um, we have groups like Habitat for Humanity. We have various environmental organizations like NRDC and the League of Conservation Voters. Um, we, of course, have our amazing YIMBY uh, movement, which has been such a spark, uh, which um, we'll all own. We, it started in San Francisco. Um, uh, maybe others might dispute me on that, but I think it probably did. And, um, and, and it's just been a game changer having uh, activists on the ground uh, day in and day out. Um, and uh, so it's been a really powerful coalition. One thing I will also say is um, housing, in my experience, is not a partisan issue. And one of the great things um, at, at the state level, and hopefully Congress can get back to this uh, someday soon, is recognizing that there are clearly partisan issues that we're going to fight um, on. That's okay. Um, but there are issues that are not partisan. We find this with a number of issues at the state level, mental health, drug addiction policy, et cetera, and housing is in that category. And, what, and I think uh, um, part of it is that you look to the top um, presidential minister. When you look at the, um, the, you know, the Obama uh, housing uh, template uh, that the administration put out, and then the template that President Trump and his administration put out before he was up for re-election and started talking about uh, you know, the war on the suburbs or whatever else nonsense he was talking about. His early um, uh, template was very similar to the Obama uh, template, which is very similar to the Bush uh, template. And so we've seen from the federal government very consistent focus on, on, on zoning reform, on, on process reform, et cetera. Uh, I have found that in the legislature, I've been able to get bipartisan support for all of our hard housing bills. We also have Democrats who, 
who vigorously oppose it and some Republicans who vigorously oppose it. But I, we have aggressive bills. Like my, my, I had authored Senate Bill 50, which was where we swung for the rafters on zoning reform uh, and opened up the doors for a number of other bills. Um, so even though it didn't pass, I think it did advance the ball. Um, if you look at the co-authors of that bill, they range from the most left-wing Democrats to some of the most right-wing um, uh, Trump Republicans because everyone, Democrat, Republican, everyone sees the pain. Everyone sees, uh, you know, I had a, a very conservative Republican colleague who signed on to co-author that bill. And he said, he said, yeah, I, my, my grandkids are, I think they're gonna move to, to Arizona. I don't want them to move to Arizona. I want them to stay in California. And so I, I think it's important when people are doing this kind of housing work, not to assume that's gonna be partisan because it, it won't. And it's very, very powerful when you have that kind of diversity of Democrats and Republicans coming uh, together. Well, thank you so much, Senator uh, Wiener, for that recap. And also just, I think, um, some good you know, next steps that folks can consider as they're beginning to build um, their coalition around these important efforts. Um, next, I wanted to see if uh, Senator Andreg was on um, and if you wouldn't yeah. mind. Oh, great. Hi, Senator, good to see you. And thanks so much for joining us. Um, I know Utah took an innovative approach by uh, tying transportation to um, into, uh, or sorry, uh, transportation funding to local governments around adoption for a menu of housing reforms. Why do you think incentives or disincentives are important in spurring local action, especially as we look to bring uh, more resources and uh, federal funding to bear in um, both housing and transportation efforts? Well, it's it's vital, right? You know, our elected officials at the local level are doing the best job they can, but they tend to be very susceptible to um, the torch and pitchforks that come out whenever we say we're going to rezone this, we're going to change this, we're going to go from you know one acre lots to you know twenty units per acre, um, and so there is this nexus between state efforts and local efforts. Where out of one side of their mouth, our local officials will say, "Well, we just don't have the political will." My my constituents will lose their minds uh, if we just rezone this. And uh, but now the other side of their mouth, they're kind of behind their hand going, yeah, but if you force us to do this, then we can blame you and it's the right thing to do. So um, it is it's vital when we're talking about giving them political cover to do the things that everybody acknowledges that they want to do or that they need to do. Um, it, it, it allows the ball to move. And I, I was in a in one of the smoke filled back rooms here in the Republican caucus not too long ago. Just kidding. We're in Utah. We don't smoke. But we were there and we were talking about these things. And I, I, you know, I'm I'm a conservative Republican pushing this. I've been the chair of the Affordable Housing Commission for five years now. And I said, by a show of hands, how many of you want your kids to live with you in your same city? Does anyone want their grandkids? Well, okay. So we are having these conversations. I agree with my other two panelists here. This is a nonpartisan issue and it's something we absolutely have to do. So what we did in Utah is Senate Bill 34, we ended up tying the transportation infrastructure funds to a cadre, about 25 best practices the city could choose from. I didn't wanna come in and say, cities, you will do this and it will look like this because that's bad policy. But here are 25 best practices and you simply to get started have to adopt three or four of those. Now that allows us to have a dial that down the road, if we want to ratchet that up to five, six, seven, or eight to continue to push cities the right way. Each year they have to submit a annual report of what they're doing for affordable housing and housing zoning in general within their areas in order to qualify for this transportation investment funds. If they then qualify, we go ahead under the metropolitan planning organizations and fund the top prioritized projects. If they don't qualify, then we have to go through a much more stringent process if there's a regional aspect to get those dollars in there. So it, it ends up being this carrot versus the stick. And we've tried to balance it where to be eligible to get these funds, which is not an inconsequential money, we're talking billions of dollars each year, uh, they have to do something on their part. So out of one side of their mouth, they're saying, no, we won't want this. But out of the other side, they're saying, please give us some political cover. So we did that. We did. Um, TRZs, which are transit reinvestment zones. We've now changed that last year to HTRZs, housing and transit reinvestment zones. These are transit oriented development to try to look at 
housing affordability of 30% to housing 25% or less to transportation to make it easier so that people can live and work in walkable communities and actually decrease their overall expenses. That just passed this last year. We also put together last year the Utah Housing Preservation Fund. This is $50 million of state money and $750 million of philanthropic money that went into a nonprofit preservation fund because the state couldn't move fast enough. When we had an affordable housing unit that went on the market, these real estate investors were jumping on it and closing in six days. And we couldn't move fast enough. So we said, let's create this nonprofit. Let's bring the resources of the state and the philanthropic together. And let's go out and let's preserve these units as opposed to push these people out, put lipstick on a pig and jack up the rates. So um, that's in essence uh, what we've done. The last thing that we did last year was House Bill 82. I was the co-sponsor on that. This is the ADU bill. This is for internal units, not requiring new connections. Uh, we estimate that we could probably double or triple the amount of housing overnight by simply taking these homes that are sitting on half acre lots with really largely unused basements, because we have a lot of basements in Utah, and let's, uh, let's utilize that. Um, we were able to work through some of the cadres of working with the cities to figure out for parking and impacts on utilities and sewer and all that stuff. So um, this year, uh, I'll just finish with this. One of the biggest problems we have in Utah, and may, this may be similar to other places or not, is that uh, a city's revenue comes primarily from sales tax and from property taxes. We have a misincentive for those cities. If a city takes a one acre lot for one unit and increases it to 20 units per acre, they have an exponential increase of impact fees, but only a marginal increase of revenue to the city. And so there's no incentive versus them zoning it commercial or retail, right? Because then they get a huge influx of, of revenue and a very marginal increase in impacts. So we have to really take a serious look in order for, in Utah at least, to overcome these concerns by looking at those fundamental funding concerns at the city level to be able to remove that barrier. And that's, that's what we're working on this year. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, really appreciate the insight as well. Um, I know we are uh, running up against the schedule, but just uh, really quickly wanted to ask if you all had one piece of advice for other state legislators who have joined us on today's call um, or any of their teams, what would that be as they start to look towards reform? We'll start with you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, two things. Um, I, I think state officials have to go big. Uh, the depth of the housing crisis is needs everything um, and every option and everything has to be on the table. And um, we're at that point, we're just nibbling around the edges, we'll, we'll not do the job. The other thing in working with local jurisdictions is you really do have to be cognizant of the challenges they have, both technical expertise, resources, nimbyism. Uh, in my bill, we, we changed timelines. Uh, we, we did some exceptions for infrastructure concerns, and we put some planning money on the table. We said, we're going to help you get there. Um, you have to be a strong partner, and that means putting some money on the table, just not telling them what to do. Um, and together, uh, go big, work strongly uh, with so many folks, and you can actually do these things in your state. And frankly, we have to do it. Um, so thanks. Senator Wiener. Um. So my, uh, my, my advice, uh, uh, it mirrors advice that uh, Governor Newsom uh, used to give to when he was mayor Newsom in San Francisco and he would swear in a bunch of new city commissioners and living commission with a lot of commissions in San Francisco, probably too many, but that's a whole other issue. Um, when he would mass swear in like 20 new commissioners, he would always say to them, and it stuck out in my mind, he would say, just remember, that you are there to represent not just the people who are making public comment in your hearing, but all of the vast majority of other people who don't even know that that hearing exists. You have to represent everyone. And I think that a lot of times it is so tempting in public life and we all psychologically fall into this that the people who are sort of in your face at the hearing, on social media, emailing, calling, that they are automatically must represent majority opinion. And when it comes to housing, uh, they, they often do not. The opponents, the, the people who, the, the sort of people who are the sort of the, the NIMBYs, the people who don't want to see change in their community, they are not a majority, but they are very organized. They are very loud. Uh, they tend to be, um, uh, you know, people who sometimes have more time 
as opposed to people who are, you know, bringing their kids to school and making sure that they do their homework at night and don't have time to do all that. Um, and and there's a there's a tendency to think that represents majority opinion. And when we were doing Senate Bill 50, which was a hugely controversial, you know, bill, um, and it seemed I had colleagues who would say to me, "No one in my district supports your bill." And I would say that is false. Uh, those are the people you're hearing from. And lo and behold, there were three statewide polls that polled the bill somewhat differently over the course of its um, moving forward. They all polled in the in the mid 60s, including in, in some of the areas of the state where there was the most intense opposition. Uh, and, and and then our mayor Breed, when she was running for mayor, was the only. It was right in the middle of all this. She was the only mayoral candidate who endorsed the bill. The others opposed it. She won. And so I think it's important to really understand um, that you're going to get all this intense pushback from people who don't want to see change. They almost certainly do not represent majority view. People want, they understand they need more housing. They understand that there's gonna be change in their neighborhood. They don't think it's anathema to have single family homes and small apartment buildings in the same neighborhood. Uh, and, and, and just really looking at that big picture of what people need and where people are. Thank you. And finally, Senator Andrick. You know, I was in a city council meeting uh, last week actually, and uh, there was a rezoning discussion, one of many, and a lady got up and said, we don't want those kids from this new project going to, kid to school with our kids. And I just went, what are you talking about? Because the people that are moving into these projects, these homes, these units, they're your kids, they're your grandkids. So if they are truly the slums, what does that say about how you raised your kids? Because in Utah, at least 70% of our growth problem is homegrown. We like to have our babies. So uh, at the end of the day, we have got to educate. We have got to sit down. When I have people show up with their hair on fire because they're so upset that we're going, I have to understand where they're coming from is that so much of that middle class net worth of their, of their wealth comes from their home. And so they look at this as being an assault on their, their net worth and their ability to provide for their retirement and whatnot. And so we have to listen to each other and we have to educate people, help them understand. And data, if, if nothing else, remember this, data that supports that just because you go for higher density, greater zoning in that area does not equate slums. It does not equate the deprivation that, that a lot of people associate with it. It simply does not. So if you have good data, you can help educate people. And it takes a lot of effort on our parts as elected officials to sit down, talk to people and help bring them up to speed with what reality actually is. Well, thank you all so much for that deep insight um, as we think about continuing to build our communities and also connect them to more transit oriented communities as well. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Todman. Thank you so much, Julie, and, and thank you, actually, and, and Erica for leading us through those really powerful conversations. I'd also like to thank our panelists and the elected leaders that joined us today who, who really gave some frank insight into the work that they are doing and for sharing this goal that we have to, to really unlock the magic of the supply of affordable housing. I'd also like to thank our partners at the White House for um, really being supportive of of the work we're doing to increase the supply of affordable housing, which is uh, clearly a part and a critical, a critical part of, of HUD's mission. You know, land use debates are really difficult conversations to have and bring out the strongest opinions because it impacts the place that we all call home. These conversations can be challenging, but it helps when communities are very thoughtful about the way they look at their housing needs. And, that's one of the reasons why HUD's consolidated plan requires our grantees um, to have a real conversation with their localities and the families who live there on what their, what their affordable housing needs are. And we are currently exploring ways to use that reporting to help communities better recognize the full scope of their housing needs. You know, thoughtful conversations around zoning reform are essential to effective action and should include the voices of people who need housing choices. 
And that's why HUD hopes to foster these conversations through the Unlocking Possibilities Program in the President's Build Back Better framework. It will provide planning grants for grassroots community engagement that promotes the participation of all stakeholders. You know, it was really important today that we included jurisdictions of all sizes because we know affordability challenges are not geographically challenged. I know that when I travel across the country, whether it's Idaho, Montana, points south, northeast, that families are saying over and over again how difficult it is for them to afford a good place to live. And I'm hoping that the lessons that we uh, continue to learn from the leaders here and other jurisdictions will continue to inform the work of zoning reform across the country. Um, of course, HUD will continue to vigorously enforce the Fair Housing Act's prohibition of discriminatory state and local land use and zoning laws policies and practices. And we will continue to work with localities and with states as they try to affirmably further fair housing and unlock all of the possibilities that they have throughout all corners of their community. We all deserve to live in a vibrant and thriving community and reducing land use restrictions and expanding housing supply will help ensure that everyone has access to this kind of opportunity. We look forward to continuing this work together. We are grateful that you were able to join us today and we look forward to exploring ways that we can build more affordable housing for all the Americans who need it. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.